So hi, I'm Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and I am here with Mr. Possible, John Hutchison. And uh, we have uh, obviously discussed a lot of your effect over the last several years. Right, yeah, we sure have. And it's, uh, it's been interesting because it hasn't really ever been replicated before. We do know that one, uh, Stoyan Sargachev, uh, inadvertently replicated the effect mm -hmm. by, uh, he had a, a solenoid, he was passing some voltage parameters oh. through it. Yeah, it was fer a ferrite core, core, as I remember. Yeah, it was a ferrite core, you're right. Long, and it had a coil around it, and it was, the whole core kind of morphed around a bit. At yeah, the, and, at the end, I think. And what is, so what is it about ferrite that makes it difficult to bend? Well, it's very brittle. If you try and bend ferrite, it'll snap on you, break, it's like ceramic. And there you go. And yeah. he managed to do that. So that's, uh, that's, I would say that it was probably the first replication, but he was not able to replicate it again. It was a bit of what you call serendipity, something that just happened. Just hap yeah, that seemed to be the case with a lot of these odd pioneering energy things that are out there and people have tried to do. But in your case, you replicated your process many, many times over, right? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of determination and some fail a lot of failures and a lot of good ones, some, especially when a television crew comes in <coughs> excuse me, and you're doing it and nothing happens. Well, that's not much fun. And other times when they come in, it all happens. It's, it's interesting. And same with the scientific community, with the U.S. government folks. Things did happen, but they interpreted Ron Colonel Alexander seems to understand what that was about. Canadian government things things happened, but they didn't see it happen, but you could hear it happening. Uh, McDonnell Douglas, same thing. Um, it, it takes uh, eight hours of tape, speed it up really fast. You see all thing, all kinds of things happen. So it's problematic. My first TV show was on the news and had a beautiful levitation. And that is one of the. Uh, things that have been most inspirational to people that have followed your work over the years and being curious as to how they were achieved but then not really knowing and so what's happened recently is your work has inspired so many people mm -hmm. and those people have been able to come together and I've been fortunate enough to meet one of those uh, called Hent Urin mm. and in the course of doing some plasma experiments uh, he has achieved what appears to be a replication of your effect. That's awesome. Uh, now it's not the kind of massive samples, it's not these kind of, there was no levitation involved and it wasn't in free air. That's one thing that's very unique about your work, right? Mm -hmm. You were able to put samples in free air and they did things like glow or bend or jellyfy, right? Jellification effect and levitate and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Now mind you, it's a lot of gear, a lot of equipment. And you also had um, things where it would almost appeared to come out from the inside of something. Oh, yeah, 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 that was intriguing. I was Dr. Thurston Ludwig who filmed it. A pendulum that would okay. come and disappear and come out again kind of thing. Right, and, and, and I saw a sample in Germany where there was a, it was a, how should we say, an aluminium billet about so long and there was kind of like a hole that had come out from the inside. Okay, yeah, that happened. Yeah. And also in concrete that happened, and I had to use a fire extinguisher one time to put out a fire, because it came through a hole in the ground, through the concrete, shot up in a pattern like that of fire. Wow. And I had a CO2 gas uh, um, cylinder in that, just like that. Yeah, yeah. What the hell is that? Why, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there. And so... We have done these experiments where we found brass seems to be um, very reactive, and you found that often you had brass samples. I think you've actually got one of your samples down here, well, I have which was affected by brass. Yeah, uh, that's this is brass, I think, and copper. And well, it's, it's a, it used to be a, a bar of bar stock, as you call it. You get from the scrapyard, mm -hmm. and because I do, do a lot of machine work too, mm -hmm. I build my own things. So this piece uh, just sort of morphed into this form, and I actually cut it with a power hacksaw mm -hmm. into different pieces to see what happened and also to sell them on eBay. And mm -hmm. this thing here appears to be iron mm -hmm. or steel. Mm -hmm. And this, for some unknown reason, is brassy here and reddish up here. Now, the original piece was solid brass. 
So it was almost like the copper is separated from something and, and yeah, yeah. maybe maybe got a higher concentration of zinc from the brass down here. Mm, but anyway, it, it, brass seems to be highly affected by this. And we, we have these samples here, which are kind of like, in, hi, in historical terms, mm -hmm. the first sample probably is this one. Or no, this one maybe. Okay. And the interesting thing about this, uh, John, is it has, wow. when you see the video... Right. You see these balls. So what was, what was happening? This is a standard piece of copper plumbing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you also did some things with copper as well. And uh, it was wow. on two iron plates, very similar to this iron plate over here, mild steel. So this is heavy and mm -hmm. it's magnetic. So uh, the magnetic structures seem to be able to capture these exotic vacu vacuum objects. Mm -hmm. And what you see on here is these balls, these hemispherical balls, and there is actually a spherical section or circular section cut out of this mm -hmm. where this was lying on that iron plate. Oh, wow. And you can actually see these in the video with the ball forming, and it's cut it out, and it's 100% it's affected within the hemisphere mm -hmm. and not affected almost at all within microns outside of the hemisphere. It's not melting, and you're, you know, like, Copper is very conductive thermally. Oh yeah, very hot. I mean, I worked with it. Yeah, it's very dangerous and hot if you don't know. You know. If you're so the uh, the mm. idea that something would be completely disappearing here and not affected at all, a few millimeters away or mm -hmm. microns away, mm -hmm. uh, means that potentially this isn't hot. And you often found that when you were working with your uh, effect, that samples looked like they were very hot, but they weren't. Were they? they? No, they weren't hot. They were actually cold. Which is weird. I mean, you'd expect anything that emits light would be very active, you'd think. Yeah. And hot. Yeah. But no, it, it, Pizarro actually put his hand on one and it was cold. And was that <laughs> a long time or a short time after the effect? Well, we were doing a pre-demonstration for somebody that was coming up. I forget which who, but his wife made us dinner and we put it inside the lab. We're having dinner and we're looking at these weird little entities that Pizarro called them appearing and disappearing in the back of the area and then uh, he noticed something with one of the bars and he went over to touch it, it was, oh he's got a British accent uh, South African <laughs> right. oh oh something like that <laughs> and John I don't know I should tell George he's always telling George I don't know if he told George but anyway it was a bar about an inch and a half inch and a half maybe about that long uh -huh. and, and had a thumbprint and other fingerprints on it wow and um, I don't know if that was pre-Canadian government tests or something. Mm -hmm, I don't mm -hmm. know, but but so mm -hmm. you're saying you let, it, let a finger left a fingerprint in the aluminium, yeah, or aluminium for those uh, people on this side of the pond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I keep saying aluminium, aluminium because aluminium, I'm, aluminium, uh, aluminium. I'd rather, I'd rather say aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on, man, I'm like, aluminium. I think it's meant to be aluminium, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's but, aluminium. Why can't you speak properly? Uh, yeah. Indeed, I said aluminium. <laughs> well, I'm Canadian. Got a tiny bit of British in me. But you found actually that aluminium was the most affected element. It, it appeared so. Uh, iron pieces, steel pieces. Yes, they crumble or break or churn into something else. Uh, al uh, had a lot of al <laughs> aluminium. <laughs> oh boy, we're going there, aren't we? <laughs> aluminium. Yeah. <laughs> samples that I uh, got from uh, uh, Capital Salvage mm -hmm, in Vancouver, mm -hmm. 1919 Triumph Street, Vancouver Bridge County, <laughs> North Star Stuff. Anyway, these things I'd use for building like high voltage terminals and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I just put them on the milk crates. I all had everything mo mostly on milk crates. Right, right. Handy right. to move, handy to carry. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they would start to move around or just simply go like flower out like that and fall on the floor, move other things around. And so they all this stuff accumulated over time. I had left, speaking of brass like that, I gave Prince Hans Adam, if it's okay to say his name. Oh, go on. <laughs> a great gift. <laughs> it was a, a bar that was two inch by two inch, so yeah. about that long, and it split like that. Oh, is this the one that's like, it's, a, it's like a two inch long bar, and yeah. it's kind of like split into four pieces. Well, it's spread out. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he, hand that like, like you've got a piece of bamboo and you put an explosive in the middle and it's just gone, yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, I thought I'd give it to hand down because they'll always send me um, 
mail and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I get I'll add it to your private art collection, which you did do. The other sample I had of brass was uh, the same size, but it was all like squished up. Right. And Michael McCardle at CTV News mm -hmm. has that one. He mm -hmm. lost it, unfortunately. Ah. In the apartment when we were leaving. Right. He did a story on us leaving, Nancy and I. So he did a story for CTV News. We gave him that gift, and I, he, for some reason, lost it. Well, here's the thing. Your work has enabled me to see that, uh, like Ken Shoulders was able to see things in your work, and he published those things, thankfully. Oh, God, yeah. That those very key structures of what he called exotic vacuum objects, and uh, they are in these samples, the very same exact same structures mm -hmm. and we have a, a couple of samples here in addition to this one which, which we've talked about with the macro ball lightning structure eating the copper pipe in this case uh, we've discussed this before mm -hmm. but uh, it was a brass sheet uh, this is about three mil on this fairly thick almost a centimeter thick and it was on there at an angle mm -hmm. and it produces this uh, yin yang type structure here uh, oh, wow. And yeah. it is able, it would appear, to clean material off one side, which I call the breaker, mm -hmm. uh, and it forces it through, and there's a dimple on this side, which is, has not got a penetrated hole, and it's got a hole on that side, and then spray it down on the surface. Yet, the edge is not melted. So again, you have an effect where you have total control of this spin nuclei, this uh, copper 35, copper... Uh, sorry, copper 63, yeah. copper uh, 65, and the bit of zinc in there. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a spin nuclear. It seems to be able to move, and it comes through and round, but the material very close and adjacent to it is not melted at all. And so we have a similar kind of highly localized disruption effect going on. So there's that. But what came after that is mm. what we call the pillow. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with that. And this All is, it, this here, uh, these two pieces were pieces of brass, just 0.75 of a millimeter thick, mm -hmm. yeah? And they were laid two on top of each other in a Vega reactor, a few hundred volts, around about 700, and a few amps, uh, one and a half or whatever, uh, field uh, effect, you know, uh, field emission, produces this glow around it, and, and the, the piece of metal on top, which was actually directly on top, at some point in the experiment, moved over to one side, so it's like this oh, cool. at an angle. Cool. But the top 0.75 mil sample actually inflated, and it looks just like a very comfy cushion, doesn't it? A it pillow. does. It does. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's impressive. I am impressed to see it in real life. is very impressive. And and that is so weird. What Ken Shoulders said wow. in the interview that your wife Nancy uh, Lazarian recorded with you both, mm -hmm. he said that exotic vacuum objects can enshroud stuff. They can encapsulate it. Yep. And I've seen that on one of your 2007 samples we call Fracture. And what, what it's got is it's got these um, mesh-like of yin-yang all the way over the surface. Mm -hmm. and we've seen the same thing on a deuterium uh, nickel and carbon experiment done by a UK researcher called Lion, where it covered a piece of uh, dielectric, a piece of fused quartz, and again protected that material by enshrouding it. So it's Ken trying to do with uh, elimination of nuclear waste? Yeah, well... It, it, it wasn't when he was visiting politicians, and they were writing things down, but it, it Ken never heard back from these characters. And that's a great shame. Yeah, it However, we're, we're, it's one of the most important things. I know it's dear to your heart, it's dear to mine, to deal with uh, nuclear waste. And it, the thing is, what this process is showing, that it can seem to consume matter, and mm -hmm. it can shift matter. Mm -hmm. And from other experiments, we see that it can apparently transmute matter, and it seems to transmute matter to stable elements. And that's what you want to do if you're getting rid of nuclear waste. But you need to have a process that is repeatable oh. now as we said at the beginning you were able to replicate your work so we already knew you you showed mr possible that it was possible <laughs> to replicate this process one after the other right yeah. even though it was difficult yeah well, it, it, it was <laughs> a great determination and four warships um uh, i'm wearing one of the shirts here <laughs> there we go which it is helped it. a lot in getting equipment yeah and and 
<laughs> so you showed that it was possible, and that is, that is the major hurdle that you have to overcome in developing any technology. You have to know that it's possible. And what Henk has done here is, when you look at the samples, you see this mesh over the surface, mm -hmm. and in some places you see marks that are exactly equivalent to marks that were shared by Ken Shoulders in 1999 of an exotic vacuum object coming through the back of an aluminium plate. Oh, yeah. Exactly oh, the same. Yeah. And inside you see similar things. So we're, we're going to do further analysis on this. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing was, I said to Hank, we can't really go public with this until you replicate it. So the next experiment, he made another pillow. It's not quite as impressive as the first. Oh, wow. But it's got this inflated section here and a little bit of a blowout here. So mm. take a look at that, John. Okay. Oh, yeah. He's got some, he's got some uh, pillows here, some bulging. Yeah, that's really cool work. And it's weird because yeah, for, for this to inflate like this, wow. yeah, well, it kind of has to turn to a jelly. Yeah. Because obviously the copper in here is, hot, uh, is you know, it's very thermally conductive. And the, we, the way it's managed <laughs> to seal itself around the outside is just crazy. Well, it is. I mean, something like that is kind of very unusual and reminds me of certain things I've seen. It's got some very beautiful patterns on it, too, at the back. And this is where the, the plasma was moving around and, wow. and in a vortex and so forth. That's beautiful, piece. Now, when you see that we actually have it from a similar experiment mm -hmm. uh, where we, we're just working with aluminium electrodes, like a large, flat aluminium cathode and a, a, an anode above it, the cathode on the edge, the, the, the whole... The whole um, uh, cathode has right. these spots all over it, and you can see these little explosions going on. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? But if, under, under the microscope and under high macro photography, mm -hmm. if, as you get closer to the edge, the spots get a little bit more sparse, and just near the edge, there isn't enough. And so oh. what I think it is, you, you need to have this kind of like, it's almost like a water catchment area. You have a flood of these electrons mm -hmm. coming to an EVO launching point, as Ken Shoulders described in some of his work. Oh, yeah. But yeah. when you are at the edge of a sample like this, there is an insufficient area around it to build up this density of the fluidized electrons. And so the edge doesn't get affected in the same way as the major surface. And I think something like that is going on that's allowing the edge to kept, keep sealed. Mm -hmm. And then the the main bulk surface to become jellyfied and move. And what you actually saw pieces of material really moving quite a lot when they became jellyfied, right? Oh, of course, yeah, I filmed it as well as others filmed it. It was a large piece of small pieces of stainless steel. I'm trying to remember stainless steel and aluminium, mm -hmm. copper, <laughs> uh, steel, stainless steel. Mm -hmm. And these things would uh, just move around like jelly, actually, and or they would just bend around and freeze. Wow. So when, when you say freeze, is that like when you well, turn I, the, the energy off or the frequencies? Or? Well, I'd have the frequency still running, but mm -hmm. the, the pieces would sometimes just move like that, bend around, and stop. Like, oh, okay. So is that what's kind of happening when you've got like samples like this? They're kind of like bending around and then suddenly they come to a stop. Yeah, this was on a milk crate and curl it curled up like this. And well, it was a pair of, uh, I think it's, uh, oh yeah, okay. It's, <laughs> I can't move it. <coughs> uh, shears for cutting a uh, steel plate, uh, <laughs> or tin, tin shears. That happened a long time ago. Um, and wow. I, I, we have some samples from you, like made of aluminium, and they've like twisted and, um, and uh, uh, gone round. In <laughs> oh yeah, a lot of those, and I'm out of stock on those. those yeah, all yeah, went yeah. to um, all went to eBay buyers because mm -hmm. I was just selling, and I didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. But the fact that those went out and yeah. they they reached that they seen a new audience uh, in a new generation. Oh yeah, uh, it's that kind of thing that inspired me and uh, gave the data for being able to recognize potentially what might be going on in the process. But we're now in a state now, with, with what Henk Uren has done mm -hmm. in Holland, it would appear that he has replicated effects um, characterized Good by... Good work, Henk. <laughs> Appreciate it. By, by Ken Shoulders, the, the, and Ken. having determined what you had done, and not only done that, sequentially replicated the effect. So I, I think... think 
You showed what's possible, Mr. Possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Possible is here at your service. <laughs> what do you require, Major? Uh, and the Hutchison effect, it, it would appear, is a real effect. And uh, I think we're coming into a point of new understanding. And I am very happy to announce that I will be working on a book uh, with John called uh, Mr. Possible and the Hutchison Effect. <laughs> <laughs> and we have started gathering a voluminous <laughs> stuff <laughs> plethora yeah. of documentation which uh when when we're looking through this dump some of this documentation there's there's personal Christmas cards from Tom Bearden and and there's notes from Yuri Geller and there's things like there's uh, the, the, uh, there was a, an envelope there that was from like NASA and yeah. it was addressed to you, but did you open it? Because it looked like it was still sealed. Oh, dear. It could have been. I got a lot. Of, uh, okay, I don't sound like I'm bragging, but I will, I'll sound like I'm bragging. I did get a lot of uh, mail from NASA, NASA Pentagon. Yeah. <coughs> the Pentagon. I was on the um, Defense Department's SBIR program, Star Wars program. Right, right, right. And they keep sending me stuff. And then, <laughs> oh, not another one. <laughs> actually, uh, the squirrel that lived on my balcony got a like, good portion of that stuff. and. <laughs> And then uh, uh, <clears throat> I was going after the CIA for UFO reports for a certain person that likes them, um, wanted to do a film on UFOs. Right, right, so right, yeah. They were very helpful, very open. I said, yeah, we could, you could either come here, photocopy charges, all this. I said, oh, I don't know. But I had to go through a privacy coordinator, John mm -hmm. M. Wright. And he decided, well, we both decided, okay, we can buy the whole lot for $89.10. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get my passport notarized by a right. and all that stuff mm -hmm. that they like that secret squirrel thing, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it all worked out fine. It's, yeah, and uh, I, I see stuff from Los Alamos National Laboratory in there. Yeah, and was, uh, oh, like they 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 were uh, came with John Alexander. And yeah, there's there's notes and letters from John Alexander in there. I mean, really, you've. Uh, <laughs> You've been about a bit, John, haven't you? <laughs> oh, I've been about, I guess, you know, whatever. It's just part of life, I suppose. I mean. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, I, I, I met really a lot of interesting folks, really cool uh, people. That is very, very clear. And there's this beautiful image of you with, uh, I don't know whether you took it, but it's uh, of Ken Shoulders himself. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was uh, probably in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, really, around the swimming pool somewhere. Yeah, that was L.A., Yeah, uh, probably the 90s. Seven conference we attended to and that kind of thing on nuclear problems in the in Soviet Russia. I think yeah. that Unattended your technology nuclear. has the ability to uh, release the potential from domestic nuclear in a way that removes the problems associated with the potential for an accident and the radioactive fallout from that and radiation in general, but also remediation of waste. I think it's an important tool because it does consume matter mm -hmm. and it does appear to produce matter that is stable generally. Now, there are other technologies out there, but I think they're all the same thing. I think that what you showed mm -hmm. is the fundamental coherent matter process that is underpinning all of these various technologies that give us the potential to remediate nuclear waste. And well, so, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm. I myself am still learning. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're all you, learning, John. You're. You're. You're one of my teachers. I mean, I watch your. And you're your, one of mine. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I guess it works both. Of, I, I watch your videos. I learn a lot from them. Yeah. And I watch other folks' videos as well. Yeah. And I learn a lot from different people. So. Well, I'm. I'm learning what <laughs> nature. Oh, yeah. Spoke through your work, through the samples that we've had an opportunity to look at. So, John, thank you very much, Mr. Possible. Uh, it's been a pleasure. A real pleasure, Bob. <laughs> really pleasure seeing you here in the, the great USA. Yes, we are actually on the ground stateside, and uh, we've, we've got a lot of work, a lot of work capturing all these documents, and we're going to put a timeline together of what happened when, mm -hmm. uh, with your help, oh, yeah, and absolutely. it's going to be probably a couple of year project, I would suggest at least, to get everything in order and making sense. Um, but uh, I'm really excited about the project. So look out for a Kickstarter coming up soon called Mr. Possible and the Hutchison Eth Effect. Thank you very much, John. A real pleasure seeing you, Bob. He's an excellent cook, too. <laughs> I'm an excellent cook. <laughs> you're, the, you're the best kind of consumer. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Bye. Cheerio.